It's my great pleasure to introduce this event tonight, and at, at the end of this event, I'll be inviting you for drinks and snacks next door, so I, I get to do the, the nice bit at either end. Um, I'm delighted to welcome David Willits. Uh, he doesn't need any introduction, of course. As we all know, he's the former Minister for Universities and Science, as well as having been since 1992 MP for Havant. Uh, as a Minister for Universities and Science, I think all of those of us who've been in the HE sector for a long time hugely appreciated his enormous commitment to higher education and his insights, his enormously sophisticated insights into its workings. Prior to that role, uh, David served in a wide range of roles, including Paymaster General, he worked at the Treasury, and he worked in the Number 10 Policy Unit. And our numbers are growing. That's good. Uh, he's written widely on economic and social policy, including the 2010 book, The Pinch, uh, broaching what is now, I think, a widely discussed topic of intergenerational economic unfairness. He also more recently published for the Policy Exchange uh, a, a, a pamphlet on the eight great technologies. And in 2013, and, and certainly relevant to, to tonight, um, a, pol a pamphlet for the Social Market Foundation called Robbins Revisited. We're here um, to launch the publication of the Policy Institute's uh, third uh, pamphlet, Issues and Ideas. Um, it's a series which is designed to stimulate debate into contemporary policy. We've already had a, a three, three other, two other policy um, initiatives, one in um, defence spending. The title of David's pamphlet, which is not going to be available until after, so we don't sit flicking through it. It's going to be available next door and he's going to give us a taste of what's in it. It's called, provocatively, Higher Education, Who Benefits and Who Pays? And David's going to talk for about 25 minutes uh, and then West Streeting MP, M Labour MP for Ilford North, has very kindly agreed to act as a respondent. Um, Wes, following a very high profile career in local government and in the voluntary sector, working among other things for the Helena Kennedy Foundation, uh, has become an MP. A lot of us remember him, however, as president of the National Union of Students, and we're very grateful to him for coming along. So I'm going to hand over, without further ado, to David and then to Wes. Well, thank you very much indeed, Karen. It's great to be here. Uh, it's great to be speaking to you as a visiting professor at King's, uh, but it's good to have with me on the panel a proper MP, and Wes, I remember, I enjoyed my discussions with Wes when he was at the NUS, and of course Wes is now a member of the House of Commons. Congratulate him on that. One of the many ironies of British politics is he won with a majority, what was it, you were just saying 189? 589. 589, defeating one of the few Conservative MPs who voted against the bill. No, he abstained. Well, he abstained. He, he, all right, he abstained. He, didn't, That's not he did not support it. He did not, I, I still remember the rather heavy conversations I had with Lee Scott on that point. Um, now, I have brought out today this pamphlet and uh, called Issues and Ideas in Higher Education, Embargo for Now, which will be available at the end. Uh, and I try to get through, and I'm going to crack through it, both a very brief account of how the system actually works and then some proposals for change. Seeing some of the experts in this room, I'm going to be as quick as I can on how the system works and turn to try to give adequate time to the package at the end. But to start with this type of statement, it's one of the things that always frustrated me to talk about higher education. I fully realise that what we love about higher education is the architecture, and I'm about to spend 25 minutes talking about the plumbing. And I apologise for that. And when I talk about the plumbing, it doesn't mean that we uh, fail to grasp the significance of the underlying uh, value of higher education and the advancement of knowledge, as put beautifully there by Cardinal Newman. Uh, and, but how, however enlightened and elevated your picture of higher education, we still need to sort out some model for paying for it, and we still need to work out who pays, and however highly you value it, it doesn't mean that you get, you can simply ignore those financial and economic questions, which are ones I'm going to focus on. Uh, let me now turn to a, a quadrant which I'm very proud of, because it's something we published in Biz while I was the minister, which tries to capture the fact that higher education brings many benefits, and you can think of them on kind of two axes. There's the economic benefits and the non-economic benefits, and there are individual benefits and there are wider social and collective benefits. And again, just to kind of sort out a set of issues now, one of the things which I often found quite sterile a bit about this debate is if you drew attention to the fact that individuals have economic gains from going to higher education, which is clearly true as an overall statement, 
it doesn't mean that you're denying that the other three quadrants are also there and also exist. Uh, and this is a this is a clue. This chart is also a clue to how I embarked on the pamphlet, and I actually reached a rather different conclusion than when I was setting off. When I set off writing the pamphlet, the model I thought we could have as a set of principles underlying public fi uh, underlying the finance of education was that basically the balance of public payment and private payment should broadly match the balance of public benefits and private benefits. There are public and private benefits, and it would seem a one reasonable starting point that the graduate, not the student, because we don't put people off going from university, the graduate pays back roughly to capture the percentage payment that matches the, the private benefit, and the public contribution equals the public benefit. Uh, and, I, and I came off that principle for a couple of reasons. Um, one was, it's actually not a model that is widely used across public services. We don't say individuals gain from healthcare and society gains from people who are fit and active and contributing to the workforce, so we should charge them for their, for their operation in, in proportion to the amount of gains from healthcare that accrue to the individual recipient. Uh, so we don't actually try to operate across public services like that. And secondly, it is not necessarily a very progressive thing to do. You may find that people who were a lot better off as a result of going to university are nevertheless finding that a significant proportions of the cost of their education is being borne by the generality of taxpayers, many of whom will have lower incomes than the graduate. So there was a, the public-private principle seemed to conflict with a fairness and progressiveness principle. But it would, in, in theory, be possible for people who wish to uh, use the current structure that we've got to go for a public-private balance of the sort that uh, would be justified by some of the evidence. And just to finish off on the individual economic benefits, it's worth remembering how big they are. Uh, those are the, the economic returns that, on average, individuals get from going to university after netting out uh, tax and student loan repayments. You are, there is a real graduate premium and there's, a, there's an endless stream of stories in the media about unemployed graduates or is it worth going to university. The amazing, the amazing fact is that in the 50 years when participation in higher education has gone from 5% to almost 50%, the graduate premium, the extra you come, earnings you command as a result of being graduate, seems to have remained pretty stable and pretty substantial. In fact, an economist looking at this would say there aren't enough people going to university. If the, the, the graduate premium should have been competed down to a lower amount if the marginal person was going to university. But there is still a substantial graduate premium, and uh, it's one of the reasons why it is reasonable to expect graduates, again not students, but graduates to pay back for the cost of their higher education. Um, and the graduate repayment model has made it possible to get more cash into our universities for teaching, those are some rough figures, uh, but for five years of austerity, for universities to end up with cash income coming in to pay for teaching that may be up to £2 billion pounds higher in total than they had at the beginning of the period is not a bad outcome for our universities. So that's a sort of very quick uh, run through of some of the background to what I'm proposing. Some people said that what uh, we brought in constituted the privatisation of higher education because we just expected graduates to pay back. We expected that fully to fund higher education. There are actually still several important forms of public contribution to higher education costs. But I, and I recognise one of the problems is none of them are immediately visible, with the possible exception of the uh, direct funding for some people from American backgrounds. They're not immediately visible to the average student or graduate. But 
there is a, an extra cost contribution for the costs of high cost subjects. And incidentally, this led to a, I think a, a regrettable misunderstanding amongst people in the humanities because one, one thing people said was they've swept away all the grant funding for the humanities. That shows they don't value the humanities. What actually happened was that £4,000 of teaching grant was removed from all of the disciplines, uh, but the high cost disciplines that received extra funding because it is just objectively more expensive to teach someone physics or engineering than to teach them theology or uh, uh, English literature, then that is simply the higher cost for the engineering student isn't because we sat around saying we just need to reward people for doing engineering. It's simply an attempt to equalise the costs of doing engineering relative to the costs of doing English. In some countries like Australia, they're going to start experimenting with the graduate paying for the higher costs of the high cost subjects. That's not our model. Our model is that the taxpayer pays for the extra cost of the high cost subjects. And similarly, we help out some people from low income backgrounds in various ways, including through access to maintenance support. There is still some public capital available. Some of it is financed by universities out of their capacity to borrow from their higher income, but there is also public funding for capital because capital endowments of universities are unequal. And then there is finally this item, the resource accounting and budgeting chart. Now I think that this list reveals the underlying principle that guides higher education funding. And it isn't, and this was the thought process that I tried to convey in my pamphlet, it isn't a public-private mix calculation. It's all the public spending measures are equalising measures. They're all intended to offset particular high costs, distortions, uh, inequities in the system. So the public intervention is a series of equalising measures. And the way to think of this is to think of the average student who turns up to do a lower cost subject that doesn't require extra equipment, who comes from a typical family background, is not disadvantaged, who hasn't had difficulties in learning at school or is not suffering from any disability, and then goes out into a reasonably well-paid job for which he will or she will enjoy, on average, a substantial graduate premium. The model is that person pays back for the cost of his or her higher education through the graduate repayment scheme, and what the public sector does is try to capture all the extra costs that follow from any person who is not that kind of emblematic standard individual. That's, and so inductively, just by observation, that seems to me the principle that guides the financial structure we've got. And I think it's not a bad principle. And it has the advantage of scoring much more highly on progressiveness and equity and fairness than the public-private mix principle. Now the final item there is the resource accounting and budget charge. And I'm, I may, if there are consenting adults and people want to raise it in questions, I may go into this in detail if you really press me, but the resource and accounting ch charge, unlike the other three items there, is not an item of public spending. It is an attempt to estimate, using a set of rather peculiar assumptions, what is the likely amount of those graduate, of those loans which are not going to be paid back by the graduate by the end of his or her working life? So it's again, it's not public spending, but again, conception is one of the equalizing measures. It's a deliberate feature. If you end up not in a well-paid job, but you are unemployed, let's take an extreme case, you're unemployed throughout your working life, you're never going to repay because your income is never going to go above the 21,000 threshold. Quite rightly, we don't expect you to repay. It's not a mortgage, it's a graduate repayment system. So at the end of the, the system, at the end of the 30 years, your loan will be written off. It's another equalizing measure, and it is, this is an attempt to estimate it, but it is not public spending. Now, um, what is public spending and what is not public spending? In the next, there, there, some people make incredibly heavy weather of all of the financial, public finance rules behind higher education. The following slide tells you all you need to know about the financing rules for higher education. Anything else is unnecessary complexity. 
This is all you need to know. Loans to students are not public spending now because the loan outlay is matched with an obligation to pay it back. So the taxpayer is indeed providing resource to the student, but it does not count as public spending because the Treasury works on the basis that it is going to come back. So it does not count as public spending. The government does have to borrow money now to make the loans to students, so that's to, the resource has to be made available, but this is not regarded as adding to net borrowing. So the government, let's, this is a government where most governments have been borrowing, so the government borrows the money to provide the money to the student. It has a, so it borrows the money, but it is also, is uh, at the same time, uh, it is not adding to net borrowing because it has equally a loan that is going to be repaid. So it does not either increase net borrowing. However, it is the case uh, that the asset, when the government has borrowed the money in order to lend to the student, the asset which it holds, the graduate's obligation to pay back, is not regarded as sufficiently liquid to count as a financial asset in the government's accounts. So what you have done by borrowing money to provide it to students is you have added to government net debt. That is the, I, that, so there is one consequence, but I can tell you from over four years of heavy negotiation with them, the Treasury are almost entirely focused on what constitutes public spending and what constitutes net borrowing. Those are the things they most worry about. The RAB charge does not appear on this list because the RAB charge is not public spending. The RAB charge is an attempt to estimate how much would be public spending 30 years' time if and when the unpaid part of a graduate loan is paid back. It is a forecasting device. It is not an item of public spending. That is, and, and, and it's amazing, I, I, I mean, I, I love universities, I love academics. I sometimes think people make incredibly heavy well of what is, what is, by the way, and these are not discretionary decisions by politicians. These are just, if you apply international accounting conventions and they're interpreted by independent agencies like the OBR, this is what happens. So this is not something that politicians have fixed. This is just the environment within which we um, operate. And um, the RAM charge does not appear. So the RAM charge is not public spending, but as I said, it is an estimate of future spending in the future, a possible future public spending in the future, and how that is calculated is itself a rather peculiar and esoteric area of public finance. And how we do it. So let me now finally turn to some proposals which add up, I think, to a package that takes higher education spending to the uh, next stage. And it's not, we, the last thing we need is another. Brown Review or another Deering Review, let alone another Robbins Review. We have a structure in place. Some people think that the structure is unsustainable or too rigid. What I'm trying to show in my final package is that actually the structure can be, is quite flexible. You can calibrate it in accordance with a set of public policy decisions and a set of priorities, and reasonable people can calibrate it differently, but I'm now offering you five proposals for how I would calibrate it. First, I think the pressure point in the system, if you're a student, isn't the, the, the 9K fee and the, gra and the graduate repayment system. In my experience, students absolutely understand that this is something that they'll pay back if they're in well-paid jobs at 9% of their earnings, about £21,000. The pressure point is cash to live on today. And there is a case for some increase in the total amount of maintenance support available to students whilst they're studying. But you know, we're in the middle of a public, another public expansion round, and I'm sure what the Treasury will be looking for is a sh saving in public spending by shifting some of the maintenance grants, which are public expansion because they're money that goes out the door now and it's not going to come back. Shift more of that into loans so it's money that you will get back if the graduates are in well-paid jobs. So there's obviously a potential deal there, a shift from maintenance grants to loans, but with a, something in it for universities, uh, students of more cash for that. The second part of the package is what I want to do to help universities. And of course, 
I wouldn't help universities because it's in the interest of students, which is the 9K fee is not fixed eternally and should not be regarded as such. I think the time may have come for me to say uprating it by RPI. But I do think universities have not done enough to show where the money goes. And one of the things that I hear from students is they want to know where the money goes. So greater transparency. I would love universities to publish the kind of thing that local authorities have to publish now about where the community charge goes. So the second package is unblock the fee level and the fee loan, just raise it, raise it by RPI or something, but with more transparency. The third part is to ensure that a fair proportion of those uh, loans to students are paid back by graduates. And the £21,000 threshold is quite high. In fact, it has ended up higher than we intended it to be. Because when we set it, you will work, as you have to do, with the objective external forecast from the OBR about what was going to happen to earnings because we set it in 2010, but it comes into force in 2016. And what, has, and what has happened is that earnings have not grown as rapidly as was forecast at the time when the £21,000 threshold was set, which means that the £21,000 threshold has ended up more generous, higher relation, in relationship to earnings than was expected when we set it. And one of the reasons, therefore, why the forecast of the amount you're going to get back kept on rising was because every six months the, er the latest earnings figures came in and every six months they were a bit lower than had previously been forecast. So every six months the 21K proved to be worth a little bit more relative to average earnings. And then because the assumption was, and thereafter it is indexed in accordance with earnings year after year for the next 30 years, it was basically a model where the gap between actual and forecast earnings between 2010 and 2016 was going to determine the real amount that graduates paid back over the course of 30 years, which nobody ever planned rationally. It would not be a rational way of designing your graduate repayment threshold. So I think there's a case for freezing it. Freezing it, and one possibility would be to freeze it until, for example, an uprated labour threshold. The Labour government had a threshold of 15,000 has been uprated and I think has now got to about 17,000, continue to uprate that and when it catches up with the 21k threshold then you could uprate them both together. Uh, that, the third, that third measure has an effect on the RAM charge, on the estimate of how much you're going to pay. The fourth is a more technical thing but it, all, it also affects the RAM charge because the RAM charge doesn't currently allow for the actual cost of government borrowing, it is fixed by assumption by Treasury requirement at an artificially high figure. And I think it should be roughly equivalent to the cost of government borrowing and slowly adjust accordingly. If you make those two adjustments, three and four, between them, the RAM charge, this thing which has become to preoccupy far too many people, but just to show how sensitive it is to assumptions, the RAM charge, according to the IFS, falls from 45% to 15%. So this view that somehow we're stuck in a system where we're never going to get our money back. Two quite simple shifts. One in an accounting assumption to move it closer to the real world and one by showing that the unexpected, unanticipated gain from the threshold being higher than forecast could be corrected. Those two things bring the RAM, threshold, the RAM charge down from 45 to 15 points. And then finally, I want to, in, to embed to ensure that this structure remains flexible. If Wes and his party come back into government, they are perfectly entitled to say, uh, we need to fund our higher education on the basis of a principle of public and private contributions matching, matching public and private benefits. As I said, I, on close inspection, only that works as well as one might hope. But they could do that. They could say that they want um, uh, more cash for students. They could say universities are awash with cash and the fee level is too high and should be cut. All those are legitimate matters of public debate. They do not require that we tear up the system and start again. What, they and what you need is some framework so that every five years you can adjust the system, both in accordance with the 
political priorities of incoming governments, and also in accordance with new data. Uh, if we found, for example, that the, that, and I'm just purely speculative, the IT revolution meant that the costs of teaching were falling a lot, or the graduate pr uh, premium was falling a lot. So my suggestion is every five years, you can have a grown-up assessment of what you do to those variables. And the quinquennial review has a nice historic parallel because that is how universities used to be financed. There used to be a five-year settlement for universities. And I would love to get back to that and give universities that stability. So I say, this is, how, this is the formula that you're going to be governed by for the next five years, and you can have a legitimate discussion about the formula that guides it after that. So I think that that, that set of proposals, uh, I hope it... I hope what I've done this evening is shown to you the underlying principle which justifies significant continuing public investment in higher education, which is basically an equalising principle. Shown that it's reasonable to expect graduates to repay. Shown that a lot of the anxieties about the round charge, which assume the structure is fixed and brittle, are misplaced and show how they can be tackled. And, provide, and propose a package that is of some benefit to students, some benefit for universities, um, ensures there's a fair contribution from future graduates, and builds the necessary flexibility into the system in the future. And uh, as Wes would say in the chamber, I commend it to the House. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> Thanks. I haven't got the roving mic, I'm afraid, so um, I'm going to stand behind here um, in, a, in a lecturing fashion. But um, I was firstly just to thank David for giving me the opportunity to get stuck back into higher education so soon after my election. Uh, as David said, um, my interest in higher education stems largely from my time in student politics, and um, given the uh, departure of Jack Straw from the House of Commons and the premature departure of Jim Murphy. I'm glad the people of Ilford North saw that there was a growing lack of NUS presidents <laughs> on the green benches and um, redressed the balance. So it's good to be here and um, my kind of passion and interest in education and social mobility and higher education more specifically um, has remained undiminished in the last five years so I hope to, to get the chance to get stuck back in. For as long as the people of Ilford North continue to send a Labour MP to, to, to Parliament. Um, I think uh, my observations actually coming back and looking again at the sector and thinking about the last five years and some of the things I was complaining about um, when I was at NUS and I'll talk about the who pays bit but I just want to reassure people actually fundamentally my view about who pays hasn't changed since I left NUS which is actually rather uncharacteristic of ex-NUS presidents. Um, but um, sadly, NUS's position has changed. So, but my, my position is still the same as it was when I was leading NUS and very strongly support the notion that graduates who do disproportionately benefit from higher education should make a contribution. And I think the debate is really about how we contribute and how we can have a fairer system rather than whether we do. And I welcome the fact that there is broad consensus on this, at least in England and in Wales. Um, I do think there are still some outstanding challenges in the sector. I think um, the sector, when you look at the impact it has on students, I think it's still true to say that academically elite universities are still far too socially elite. And there are lots of reasons for that, and they're very complex, and they're not solely the responsibility of the higher education sector. But there is still far too much hand-wringing that goes on about this, and not enough progress, and I think that is um, a great pity. Um, I think that too many universities are able to blow their own trumpets as widening participation success stories when their retention rates and the um, graduate destinations and the impact that their higher education is having on their lives overall is still not good enough. And I think you can only be widening participation success stories if the experience is genuinely transformational. And I think we should be a bit more challenging to that part of the sector which is falling short. Um, I also think that, and this is particularly given my experience as a, as a, as in local government in the last five years, the public sector has had a really tough time uh, as a result of um, the inevitable difficult decisions that have to be made um, at the moment, and we can have a debate about the wisdom of various decisions, but that's not for here. Um, 
But I, it does make me think, however, that when I think about some of the frontline services that have really been squeezed in local government, higher education, largely as a result of the reforms that were put through by the coalition government, has had a relatively easy time. But I think in some cases that makes the sector bloated um, and um, insufficiently reformed. And, um, you know, I don't want to make a cheap shot at university vice-chancellors, but until someone can present me with some evidence that there is some sort of market crisis in recruitment, I do think the sector's leadership sends the wrong message to its staff who experience pay freezes when they um, enjoy inflation-busting pay increases. And I think that is just the tip of the iceberg. You then look at a front line at the project teams that are put in place and the level of bureaucracy that underpins a number of frontline activities. This is just not acceptable in other parts of the public sector. And so actually, I think there is, and, and you'd be grateful both that there isn't a Labour government and that Ed Balls isn't the MP for Morley and Outward, because I think had he been Chancellor of the Exchequer, then the higher education sector would be about to embarking on the mother of all public sector efficiency drives. So you got off lightly this time, but maybe it's time to show some self-regulation and self-leadership in terms of, um, in terms of uh, activity and resources and the way the sector spends its money. Um, on a brighter note, however, the sector doesn't do everything terribly and um, I, I remain very passionate about the role of UK higher education and the role it plays in our economy, uh, in our society, the fact that Britain punches its weight uh, well above its weight in the world and certainly um, I'm not going to be returning to the House of Commons over the next five years and arguing that your budget should be slashed. Um, I remain passionate about investment in research and science and I think that this sector can continue to punch well above its weight in the world, but it also needs to reform what it does at the same time without the, um, the, the incentive of um, austerity of the kinds that other parts of the public sector are experiencing. Um, in terms of David's report, and he sent it to me in advance, which, which I'm very grateful, um, I think there are a number of things to, to welcome, really. Um, firstly, there is broad consensus, I think, behind a whole number of aspects of the repayment mechanism, if not some of the top line numbers on fees and, 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 and the heated debate that took place when the reforms were coming through, and I think that is a good thing. I also think it's right that we should review the situation every five years or so. The sector needs some stability, but it should also be flexible and we should have the opportunity to review without completely overhauling the system and upsetting the apple cart and making um, you know, both vice-chancellors and university staff and students um, tremble at the thought of a general election and the instigation of another review to report on the other side of a general election. So I think we could do without that instability and I very much um, welcome that. Um, I think there's, in terms of who benefits, a number of things to say about this. One is, um, I think we really, I know the sector's now looking a lot more at learning gain as a concept and I think that's really important, particularly going back to what I was saying about the impact that higher education is having as a transformational experience from people from the most disadvantaged backgrounds. And I wonder the extent to which, um, in terms of graduate earnings premiums, for example, people would still be doing well if they hadn't gone to university and if they still had a whole range of innate skills and talents that they might um, maybe have honed and enhanced elsewhere, but if they hadn't gone to university. And I think it's important to understand whether university is simply being a finishing school for people who've got a good education and good skills elsewhere, or whether it is having a genuinely transformational impact. And that's particularly important in terms of the wider debate that's taking place around the economy at the moment in terms of productivity. Um, like David, I think higher education has a merit well beyond um, economic utility, but that is very important and it is particularly important for this country at this particular um, moment. The other thing I would ask the sector is, are people learning the right skills and the right behaviours to use their time more effectively when they enter the workplace? And actually here I think there is um, some really excellent practice at the, at the more modern end of the, of the sector actually in terms of the impact it's having um, on people's employability and, their, and, their, and their, both their earnings potential and their economic contribution beyond um, leaving university. And I think, again, for, in terms of protecting the higher education sector, having given, given aspects of it kicking just a few minutes ago, uh, I do think that if the sector doesn't get this right, it's going to be in danger of being outside of the direction of Treasury thinking. And that is absolutely crucial, as, as David will, will know from having negotiated with the Treasury as a higher education minister and really stood up for the sector. Um, that is ultimately where the most important decisions are made. And if 
the Treasury is making difficult decisions and they don't feel the higher education sector is contributing the way it could or should, um, that's when the, 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 the pinch is really felt. I think it's right also to ask questions about the private sector contribution and higher education. There was a, there was a, um, a triumvirate identified by um, Ron Deering in his report in terms of beneficiaries and I think it is important to ask some questions about the private sector contribution and not, I don't mean that in a crude slap 3% on corporation tax um, kind of way um, but I do think there is a, a slightly more sophisticated debate to be had about the interface between business and higher education and the way in which business might fund certain activities or there may be a better partnership between um, business and the sector. One of the things that I did notice about David's um, report is that it, it didn't say a huge amount about the role of market forces in improving higher education. And my sort of question for David is, uh, I wonder if that's because he's maybe given up on the idea that <laughs> marketisation is, is, is the lead to quality improvement, um, or, whether, or, whether, or whether he's just avoided that particular hot potato. But I think the, the question would be an interesting one to hear David's answer on. The other thing that I wanted to just say a couple of things about was about the repayment proposals and the changes that he would make, because he's proposing that you freeze the repayment thresholds and that, in part, and the savings there um, enable you to be more generous with the loans, not least because you're um, taking away student grants. I think there is actually um, a, a debate to be had about student finance. Um, some of you remember the graduate tax proposals that we published when I was president of NUS. What I was not um, characteristically um, not um, courageous enough to put forward was the second part of that work, which was around student finance. And my view was that we needed to be more generous with the amount of maintenance support available to students, because I think that the cost of living um, impact, and we see this through NUS's pound in your pocket research, because students don't have sufficient resources to fund their studies, they are having to work longer, and particularly if they're from poorer backgrounds, and not just poorer backgrounds, lower middle income families, um, and that does impact on their studies because they're spending more, or actually in the wider experience, they're spending more time stacking shelves than they are getting involved, uh, not just in lectures and the library, but also sports clubs and societies and all of that wider enrichment. So I think we do need to look creatively in the current fiscal climate around how we can be more generous there. Um, and that, that's the sort of the, the upfront support bit. There is also something around the repayment mechanism as well and how we make it more progressive. I think something we need to look at, um, rather than necessarily freezing the repayment threshold, is actually looking at the interest rates that students are, are paying and actually the taper. It is already a progressive repayment system. I wonder if we could make it more progressive because my concern, and I think this was borne out in the recent UUK publication around student finance, my concern is if you freeze the repayment threshold, actually the people who will be impacted upon most will be people, I think, in the, in the lowest decile in terms of the amount they would repay over the course of their um, uh, 30 years of, of repayment. And those who wouldn't be impacted upon at all are people in the top three deciles. So actually, that very small change um, in, in practical terms could actually have a regressive impact where it is, if you change the interest rate taper, then you have a, both a progressive impact and you achieve what David wants, which is to make sure there's a bit more money in the system. Um, the shift from grants to loans, I think, is a far wider debate, and I will sidestep that for the moment because um, the Labour Party has no policy at the moment because we have this wonderful leadership vacuum, which means I can say whatever I like. Um, but I don't want to find that our new leader, therefore, comes along and embraces a position that's the complete opposite. And um, Joe Johnson is standing at the dispatch box quoting me. So I'll <laughs> sidestep that one diplomatically, but I think you'll find I may be sympathetic. I also think, um, in terms of the graduate tax debate, which is already rearing its head again in the Labour leadership contest, because some people haven't noticed the last five years um, and the last six months of the general election campaign, uh, I just think, the, as much as I think in principle the graduate tax is a really good model, the cost and the practical issues, both in terms of how you shift from one system to another, but also the European Union students' repayment issue as well, I think it is, it's a red herring, so beware Labour leadership candidates bearing a graduate tax, because they will promise one thing and then they'll come in and find it's not practically possible, um, would be my advice, and we like to have um, well-evidence-based policy um, in the new modernising Labour Party that will win the next general election. Um, 
unless I'm Jeremy Corbyn's shadow higher education, <laughs> in which case we're doing all sorts of different things. Um, the other thing I would say um, is the University Alliance proposed um, or put some research out, which I think was basically saying that the thing that people really care about, certainly or families really care, but care about is more about how quickly yeah. students will pay or repay the debt yeah. and the total amount owed. Uh, I did lots of polling when I was at NUS to try and make, justify a particular um, argument. I'm not, I think that's a red herring, actually. I think if you explain the system correctly or if you explain some of the consequences, I, I, think, I think that's a sort of a, a blind alley, actually, so I wouldn't encourage us to go there. But one thing I, I, I am concerned about is, I mean, David in his, in his document talks about changing repayment conditions. I, I feel very strongly, having worked with Martin Lewis um, on David's behalf and on behalf of the coalition in terms of helping to communicate the facts around the student finance system that the government put in place, I feel very strongly about the fact that you really shouldn't be in the position of changing repayment conditions for students who are on existing courses or have left university. If you're selling a financial product on a series of, of you know, on a certain deal, you can't then just go tinkering about with it retrospectively. We, we wouldn't do that in any other form of um, taxation, for example. Um, so I'm, I'm, I think I'm very uncomfortable with that, although it does worry me. I think David actually refers to it in his report. I think technically it is possible on the face of what people sign up to when they take out their student loans and their student finance. I think from a sort of legal point of view, I think it seems to me it is possible, um, but I think it's morally unjustifiable. And by all means, let's have a debate about the future terms and conditions, but for students on existing courses and for those who've already graduated, I think it would be deeply unfair to change their repayment conditions. Um, the final thing I wanted to say actually was about the RAB charge, and I agree with David, we could spend a long time this evening um, doing lots of heat and, and no light really on the subject. It does make me anxious, however. It's just, to be honest, David's slides just sound a bit too good to be true. And um, I, I don't want some poor Chancellor of the Exchequer in 30 years' time finding this money appearing on the books um, in terms of debt write-off. Um, and, and that there is a, a, a cost down the line. And I think we, the problem, my problem with the RAB charge debate is that there is still a debate, and I think um, we need a really authoritative look at this. I would recommend the Public Accounts Committee look at this, but they did look at it, and they came up with an answer that I think was wrong. Um, and not just me, I think other people think was wrong. But I think it would be good to really understand the RAB charge issue because it is so central to many of the other things here. But if, as David argues, that you can do a bit of account, you know, accounting trickery or um, maybe um, a, a better accounting reality that you can generate more resource for the sector, um, I think that can, that can only be um, a good thing. So um, on the whole, I think um, I welcome the report. I'm glad... Um, David may no longer be a member of parliament, but is still very um, active in the higher education debate. And I hope that this is a report that not only his own side will be looking at and reading very carefully, but my side as well, because I think that there is some interesting ideas in here which could actually make a practical difference to students, which is ultimately what we're all about. Okay, thank you very much, Wes, for that uh, challenge to all of us uh, in our different roles. Um, we've got 15, 20 minutes or so for questions, and I wondered if I could just take the liberty of posing Wes's question to David, which was the, the question about uh, mar market forces in higher education. There's not a huge amount in this political, in this particular pamphlet, but it's something you've discussed mm. uh, a great deal in the past. Um, so could we kick off with that, David? Yeah, I mean... What does marketization mean? It's, it, marketization is setting down to the ram charge, the way it's kind of got into the debate. Uh, the, the, I think there is competition for students, and there's more choice for students. It was, w once you have a repayment structure like ours, it was never going to be on the basis of fee level. Someone who said, oh, it's, 8750 to come to King's and it's 8250 to go to the LSE, so I'm going to save 500 pounds and go to the LSE, would not be understanding the basics of the financial model mm. because it's it's all it's a, it's nine percent of your earnings later on that determine it. That would be a so 
we very early, once the repayment debate got going, we very early got off the idea that it's a kind of price competition model. But there are lots of other ways in which markets can deliver competition. And so the thing, one thing that I'm most proud of looking back in the last few years is getting rid of the number controls. So what has happened, and I don't know the figure of the kings, but literally, in the old days, kings would be told, you can recruit 3,710 students, and if you recruit number 3,711, you will be fined for it. Now, we were able to get rid of those number controls because it's a graduate repayment scheme. The reason for the expenditure control, the, the reason for the number controls in the old days was there was so much public expenditure per mm. student. It was how the Treasury controlled public spending. Once you shift to a graduate repayment model, you don't need number controls to operate like that. Uh, and that has meant that although well, universities don't have rubber walls, that means it is possible for Kings to say, you know, we've got 10,000 applicants this year, and actually we can take on 4,000, or take on 4,250, or we can do a property deal to put up some, increase our capacity, and down the track aim to be recruiting 5,000. That is a kind of way in which markets work, and those students, of course, should be acting with proper information. And the NUS has now made an agreement with the Consumers Association, mm -hmm. Despite all the rhetoric about consumerization, with the Consumers Association to provide more information for prospective students about the kind of experience they'll have at different universities. And I want to see the students, prospective students, acting on that. They can now act on it. But that agenda for good quality data, I suspect, is another area where Wes and I agree. I personally think the data that universities are currently required to publish is only a start. I think there's much more they should be publishing. Um, and so then you would have genuine informed student choice, but without price competition. Okay, question right at the very back. Oh, I think one of the for our current system is actually the counterfactual in Scotland in terms of the degree of savings having to be made in other sectors of education to pay for a no tuition fee regime, most notably, of course, I would say in terms of further education colleges. My question, David, is uh, the recent OECD report opined that uh, England was an outlier in not making significant amounts of provision at levels four and five, a full sub-degree sub level, responding directly to the needs of industry in a flexible and part-time way, which actually drove up productivity and increased individual prosperity. I struggle to see in what of any one of your five key recommendations would change provision towards sub-degree provision responding to the needs of industry, unless it's some kind of variation on condition two. And I'd be interested to know how you might incentivize that type of provision. Well, I mean, that is a fair point. And of course, I'm not, this is a pamphlet on some specific issues. I'm not trying to uh, sort of tackle every issue in higher education and training, but uh, of course, the previous government did try with the foundation, even the Labour government, the pre-2010 government, did try with foundation degrees to make progress in that area, and foundation degrees are now embedded in the system. And although the alternative providers agenda got very controversial, the fact is what they were often offering was HNCs, HNDs, well-recognised sub-degree level qualifications. But uh, I accept your point that there is more to do in that area, and I'm sorry I didn't rise to that challenge in this pamphlet. Thanks. Um, you both talked uh, in, in, in your talks about the need for universities to demonstrate the added value for the 9K fee, which is, is understandable. What sort of evidence are you expecting uh, from universities? And in your responses, if you could put it in the context of the Conservative Party's manifesto commitment to reward, to create a framework to reward teaching quality and what you think that might look like. Yes, I mean, I thought Wes was a bit tough on universities and their costs. My, my view is that we should remember where this structure came from. And this, the structure that we're working within goes back to the Blair government in the middle of the first decade. And it was universities who worked out 
that whilst university finance was public expenditure, it was going to remain pretty much at the back of the queue for public spending. I mean, the surge of public spending that happened in delay, underlay post-1997, even then, the amount of resource per student continued to fall. And that's why, incidentally, and I agree with Wes, why I'm a sceptical about the link, a graduate tax. It brings it back into tax and public spending. So it was the universities that eventually went to Blair and said, we cannot carry on like this. You cannot. And if you look at the figures, the unit of resource behind a higher education <coughs> student fell steadily for 15 or 20 years, even whilst it was being protected for a school student and being increased for a kid at nursery. Uh, so I see this as partly reversing some reductions in the unit of resource per student that had been so deep that they had affected the quality of the student experience in the film. As to how you measure it in the future, and we've got Stephanie Marshall from the Higher Education Academy here, I mean, there is a very lively debate about it. I think that, the, that some measures of learning gain, some kind of survey, cognitive assessment, a representative sample of students who do a comprehension, a sophisticated comprehension test in their first term at university and some kind of mathematical symbolic reasoning test in their first term at university and then do a broadly similar test in their final term at university. Are they any better at after three years of higher education? Well, they bloody well should be. Mm -hmm. And if they're not, there is something that higher education should be doing for them which it is failing to do. And there is a... In school, well, and I, I don't, schools and universities are not the same, and I think there are issues in the way the school's policy emerged, but at least in schools there was a recognition of the challenge of the coasting secondary school, which appeared to get good results, but got the good results because it essentially recruited the bright kids at the age of 11, was in quite a prosperous area, they did okay, and emerged with reasonable A levels. That may not be adding delivering the same amount of educational gain as an academy in a tough area, really helping people forward. And, we, and where eight years behind schools is they haven't really got into that debate yet, and I think they need to, and the metrics uh, will take years to develop, but they're on their way. I'm absolutely clear about it, they're on their way. Wes, do you want to respond to that? Yeah, well, I, I was tough on universities. That's partly to reassure people haven't gone soft in the last mm. five years. Um, and also because I, I, just, I just want to see the sector doing better and I, I do think there is something to be said for um, the sort of the challenge and the stretch that other parts of the public sector, I mean, our universities are slightly one step removed from the public sector, but I think other sectors have had to think really hard and deeply about what they're doing and how they improve and how they use resources effectively, partly because of the, the bruising experience they've had with with spending cuts in the way that this sector hasn't. And the, the higher, UK higher education will only continue to be um, a world leader if it is constantly raising its game, because other parts of the world are. If you look at the rate of investment and reform in other parts of the world, you know, the, the global higher education is changing so rapidly that this country needs to, um, needs to keep up. And I think, I mean, you know, David's right, and I sort of referred to as well, learning gain or what you might call distance travelled I think is a really, really important yeah. measure um, and there, there, there is a probably a huge debate and knowing the higher education sector, a lengthy review chaired by someone very worthy with a wide range of sector stakeholders um, in his train to... Wes, you're think, the man for the job. Think about it. Oh, no, thank you. Um, <laughs> I still remember the Burgess review and other things. Um, so I think um, I think that's I think that would be a really important thing to, to do. The only other thing I just um, uh, touch on were well, a couple of things that um, I think do relate to sort of quality and experience and access. I mean, there is a, the big question of part time where I think there there are some real challenges there and things aren't working. That touches partly on Martin's question as well, um, but um, also um, in terms of international student um, experience as well and access um, and. Um, what we do about the Home Office, because I think it, um, I think there are some real challenges there in terms of global U, the UK's position in, in the world and the damage that's being done to our reputation and access to UK higher education from around the world that we need to address. Thanks. I've got a question here. There'll be a lively debate about learning gain. Mm -hmm. However, the committee is constituted. Mm -hmm. We've all got lots to say. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs>
Thanks, I'm John Brennan from the LSE and Open University, and I'm really wanting to perhaps extend the comments that were made from the Association for Colleges and Wes has just referred to it, which it seems to me that a lot of our debates and policies about higher education fail to fully recognize how diverse and differentiated our higher education system has become. People go into higher education at different stages in their lives. They may study full-time or part-time. We've said nothing and hear very little about postgraduate uh, um, education. Um, what are the public and private benefits that come from that? You know, there's, a, there's a, I think, a, a, a broader agenda that I don't really hear being being yeah, I mean, I think those are, I, I mean, that is a very fair point. I accept that. And the, there, is a, there is still a kind of core model, which is how you have to public debate HE, which is the stage in the life cycle, 18-year-olds, 19-year-olds, 20-year-olds going to university after school or college. And that is still a very important experience for a lot of young people. But you're right, there are many other forms as well. And I think that what I am trying to do here does contribute to the challenge you're putting, and it's the, fol the following reason. If people think that the graduate repayment loan model is somehow unaffordable and unsustainable, there will not be political support for extending it. If people realise that it, it is flexible and is affordable because you've got the capacity to ensure a fair repayment from graduates, and what constitutes fair is a legitimate subject of political discussion, then you can do things like extend loans to postgraduates. And we had the irony that we had the, the, the higher education media agonising that the system is unsustainable and can't be afforded, when the Treasury, who certainly understand the bare bones of the system, as I put it out this evening, were absolutely agreeing with proposals that um, INLs were bringing to them for postgraduate loans. If the system was so bad, they'd never have gone for postgraduate loans. So I see this getting people a bit more um, uh, understanding of the flexibility and the strength of the graduate repayment system is a precursor to other ways of extending it. Uh, I would like to, I think there is a very strong argument, for example, in the light of what's been happening to part timers, for going further in process that I did begin of reversing the ELQ measures, mm. extending the range of subjects which are eligible for part-time loans, even if you have already been to university. But this is the necessary groundwork in order for the only feasible way of meeting those requirements to be met. We have another question here. Hi, I'm uh, Evelyn Ashen Griffiths from the Department for International Development, uh, where I work on higher education. And I'm really pleased, Wes, that you raise, and, and David as well, the kind of huge gains that higher education is making around the world. And I was wondering, do you think, I mean, I know this stuff is, it's innovative, but it's still within a kind of traditional structure that, that we do understand. And do you think that maybe we're not necessarily looking outside of the box enough and thinking about kind of examples from other countries where Obviously, circumstances are hugely different and systems are much bigger in a lot of these countries. Um, but do you think we have opportunities to be a bit more creative about what we're doing and sort of thinking how we can bring in newer ideas into the mainstream? I'm p thinking particularly around access policies. I mean, if we looked at countries like Brazil or, if, or technology enabled education, where I still think we probably turn our noses up at it, despite the fact that we have some leading technology enabled universities in this country. No, I completely agree. I went to the launch of a important educational program for Africa. It literally was a launch. I went to Kourou, the European Space Agency space launch facility in Guyana, and saw the rocket launched. And it was the big satellite. The main purpose of the satellite that was launched was it was going to extend broadband coverage over Africa. And, because, and uh, there are still many parts of Africa where you haven't got a very good mobile phone signal. 
and they saw one of the main programmes that would be delivered using the broadband coverage that they're going to provide would be educational programmes delivered online, which are currently for which schools which schools in Central Africa could not currently access. And if there's one of the frustrating, one of the many things that used to wind me up in the media comment was, uh, why are you doing aid programs for country, countries that have got space programs and got satellites? You need satellites to deliver space. So, yeah, I agree with you about EdTech. And I do welcome, I know you've been a crucial part of this, I think there's also been a th change of thinking in DFID, where our aid department, unlike several other advanced countries, was very preoccupied that educational aid was all about early years and schooling. <coughs> Uh, and as you heard me, we discussed this before, one of the things that I found, I had some of my most uncomfortable conversations with ministers from developing countries was when they said, why will you not, uh, with an example, why, will you why do you not fund people to study geology at university level in this country? We need geologists if we're to argue properly with the resource companies and the oil companies. Of course it's right to send more kids to primary school, but why are you, alone amongst advanced Western countries, completely failing to contribute to our need for people with higher education when other advanced Western countries come along and offer them scholarships to geology in their universities? We'd love them to go and study geology at your universities, but you have no program whatsoever to help us in those circumstances. And the range was that one extreme was Germany, where 66% of German educational aid goes to higher education. Britain is at the opposite extreme. Only 6% of our educational aid is for higher education. The World Bank's thinking is now shifting, a recognition that higher education matters for development. DFID's thinking is shifting. Uh, and we really do need to raise that game. OK, where's all this international comparative question? I mean, I th I'm quite excited, actually, to because it's to be honest, it's, it's part of um, international development policy that just doesn't come naturally or at the forefront of thinking. So I'm quite excited to find that DFID is already doing stuff in this area, but I think there's 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 huge scope and potential to look at doing things differently. I was I, I was quite excited to um, hear about some of the stuff that the Open University is already doing in terms of their provision globally and the extent to which there's a big access um, there's a big access agenda there. Um, but I think there you know there is stuff to learn from other parts of the world. Um, tying slightly into the last um, question as well. On postgraduate uh, education, I have to say I'm, I'm, less, I'm less bothered about widening participation in um, postgraduate education. I'm more interested in widening access to higher education for people from more disadvantaged backgrounds. I think there is a bit of a risk, actually, that postgraduate study becomes a one or two year work avoidance scheme <laughs> rather than people <laughs> actually wanting to go in to do a postgraduate course because there is a personal academic interest that is genuine and sincerely held um, and not just when you're making the case to mum or dad or the bank manager to send you, the, send you there um, or, or you've got a kind of a professional application and my worry is by spending public money um, on opening up more opportunities then that those resources could be better spent elsewhere. I'm more interested in looking at people who feel they can't access postgraduate education but would benefit and making sure those people do that and spending public money in that way. Which is why actually I, was, I wasn't I was entirely bowled over by the announcement the last coalition government made and I was even more disappointed that Labour Party just rolled over and said yes rather than actually we've got a more a fairer way of spending the money you're allocating to this. Okay, I, I sense that we could go on a very long time, particularly on some of these wider themes, but we've got drinks awaiting us next door, and we've got this, <laughs> uh, which everybody must Suddenly be Suddenly the questions have dried up. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, can you join me in thanking David Anwes for being so candid and so interesting this morning? Thank you. Thank you so much for doing that.